Good. Hey, I wanted to start off with a question. Uh, and so I'm going to need a little participation. You can say after this question is over that you raised your hand at church, okay? So it's, I'm going to do a little scientific poll, okay? Here's what we're going to do. I, I want to know what your favorite time or when your favorite time to eat is. Do you, are you a lunch person, a breakfast person, or a dinner person? So lunch, get any lunch people, okay? Uh, dinner, all right. Uh, breakfast, I feel like breakfast and dinner are pretty much tied. Um, but now you can tell people you raised your hand at church. So way to go. Amen. Uh, my favorite is dinner because normally, uh, if you're going to have dessert, it's always followed. It always follows dinner, right? I, I love key lime pie and, um, I have eaten it for breakfast, but it's never a great way to start your day. Okay. So I just, that's your tip of the day right here. Uh, you heard it here first. I also like um, dinner because it's the only meal that my family and I eat together, though I use the term together very loosely because if you're a dad or a mom of, of young kids, you know that as soon as you're about to sit down, your kids have a request. Um, so my kids, I go to sit down and they're like, hey, we need the Chick-fil-A sauce. I'm like, we're eating pizza. Um, <laughs> they're like, I need Chick-fil-A sauce, please. Um, they, they, uh, always need water. I mean, I've taken my kids to the ER for, for dehydration, but they, they, eat, they drink like 17 cups of water uh, at, at dinner. So anyway, I have resorted to just eating out of bowls because bowls are very portable. And so you can just carry them while you get your steps in. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, but why am I talking about dinner? Well, tonight, we're, or today, tonight, it's not tonight yet, uh, but today we're going to be uh, looking at a scriptures in John chapter 12, and it's about a dinner party. So if you go ahead and uh, turn there, um, I'd appreciate it. And let me set the scripture up for us. Uh, it, Jesus is uh, nearing the end of his ministry, and in John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead because he's good like that, okay? And he's showing that he has power over death uh, and hell. And, and because of this, good news is spread and people want to kill him. So he leaves Bethany and he moves to Ephraim uh, with his disciples. But now in John chapter 12, we're back in Bethany. Um, one thing of note, this is about the anointing of Mary. And I think it's important to note that uh, there's three separate anointing accounts in the Gospels. All four Gospels contain an anointing story. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell of the same event. Uh, Luke is, is an event that happens earlier in the life of, of Jesus' ministry. And then this event, John's event, um, in John chapter 12. I just think it's uh, important to note because uh, oftentimes I myself saw this as one single event told four different ways, but it's not. Um, so, uh, as we look at the dinner, I've broken the text into four, uh, sections and the, the, we're going to look at it today. It's, it's the dinner, Mary's gift, Judas's response and Jesus's defense. And the big idea, the take home today is intimacy with Jesus frees us to live selflessly. So, uh, let's, uh, look at the dinner, John chapter 12, verse one. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. So we're six days before the Passover feast, which is important because this means this is the night before the triumphal entry. Um, this is only days before Jesus's death. And we're in Bethany, which is situated a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. Uh, and it was very common for people coming for the Passover feast to uh, stay in towns that surrounded Jerusalem. Um, Jesus is back at his friend's house for dinner. And, uh, you know, any good dinner party always has a guest list. So let's, let's take a look at the guest list, okay? Jesus, he's the son of God. You know him. Uh, Lazarus, uh, uh, he's a Jesus. He's always talking about his grave clothes. Uh, Martha is a servant heart award winner every year. Uh, Mary is the chooser of the better. And then we have Judas, who's one of the disciples, a betrayer of Jesus. Uh, he loves coins and he steals money, okay? Um, that's his notes. So uh, this dinner wasn't uh, any type of dinner. It, it was special because John, 
John describes it as they were reclining at the table. Uh, reclining versus sitting signifies something to us, and it signifies that it was uh, bigger than just another meal. Uh, it was a special event. Uh, people sat for dinners. They reclined at feasts. And Lazarus actually is a picture of all of us who are in Christ. Uh, he was brought from death to life, and now he's feasting with his Savior. Uh, communing with him. He isn't running around. He's reclining with Jesus. He's resting from his work. And, and our new life as Christians isn't about doing. It's about, it's about being. And, and, and we see that here in Lazarus. We can sometimes, I know myself, I can get, get the doing stuff for Jesus mixed with the being with Jesus. Uh, and, and the only way we can take him to our family, to our world, to our workplace is, is by spending time with him. And if we aren't spending time with him, we can't take him where we're going. So uh, people don't need us. People need Jesus through us. So um, we've seen the guest list. Now let's look what happens next. This is Mary's gift. Verse three. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus's feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The best way that I've heard this described is think about a mount about of a size of a can of Coke, what's found in a can of Coke that that's uh, cost one year's salary. So if you took that in America, that'd be a diet Coke, preferably for me um, with um, the, and the average salary here in America is about $30,000 for an individual. So a diet Coke can that costs $30,000. All right. Uh, and, and that's just hanging out in, in, in Mary's house. And if something like this was in my house growing up, they would have hid it from me. Um, I had a whole room that I wasn't even allowed to step foot in. And if I thought about it and my house wasn't big, like if I even thought about it, my parents would yell at me. Did y'all have one of those? Y'all, the nice living rooms? Yeah. I think we've kind of outgrown that, but um, needless to say, this bottle um, is just chilling in her house. And, and scholars believe that this was a family heirloom that was passed down to her. And this perfume was a status symbol. So it was something that, that not everybody had. And based on what we know about Mary, this wouldn't have been something that she went out and purchased. Um, this perfume wasn't a cheap knockoff either. It was the best. Uh, and that's why John makes the point to call it pure Often these perfumes were mixed with other oils to increase the volume and cheapen the cost. But in the case of Mary's perfume, it's pure nard. And, and because of its purity and the way that it was bottled um, and sealed, uh, much like oil or wine is sealed today, once, once it's opened, uh, the shelf life is not long. But, but why would Mary even think to do something like this? Imagine the scene with me, if you will. We're going to go to to, to a dinner, all right? Uh, you guys, uh, you get to the house. Um, you're greeted at the door. Someone comes up to you and uh, the, the host and, and he anoints your head with oil and you step into the house and there's a stool and a little basin of water and you take a seat and you clean your own feet. Uh, and then you go and you recline at the table. But, but you, you cleaned your own feet, not the host. Uh, the only time you wouldn't clean your feet if you went over to someone's house is if they had servants, because the act of cleaning another person's feet was beneath people. Even, even women weren't seen, uh, in high, in high, or regarded as in high regards, uh, in that time. And they would not even clean someone's feet. It was, it was a servant's task. And, and, um, this is something that, that they would only, uh, clean with water. Your feet would only be clean with water. They wouldn't use oil on your feet, your feet are just going to get dirty again. And they especially wouldn't use oil that costs $30,000. So you're reclining at the table, which some, looks something like this. You're eating and then you start to smell something. And, and you look around because you've never smelled something like this before. And, and you're, you're thinking, man, like what, what, what's going on? And, and then you look down and you see, you see Mary at Jesus' feet. And you're like, what is she doing? And then you notice the empty bottle. And she's poured out all the perfume on Jesus's feet. And that's odd. Why is she cleaning his feet? What's, what's going on here? You're confused. And then you see her get even lower. And she starts to wipe his feet with her hair. It's hard to even put into words how shocking this scene would have been, even for followers of Jesus who had seen some stuff. Like, because not only has Mary poured out her fragrance on his feet, 
$30,000 worth of perfume. But she gets down even lower and she starts to wash it with, his, with her hair. Why her hair? Within Jewish uh, culture, adult women only showed their hair to their husbands, period. Their hair was reserved for him alone. First Corinthians talks about the glory of a woman is found in her hair. So, so at this point, your jaw is wide open. You, you can't even believe what's happening. Mary is revealing herself to Jesus. She was opening herself up to him. She didn't care. She, she gave all of herself. And I mean, it doesn't appear based on what we know about Mary that she was married at this point. And so in this act, she opened herself up in a way that she had never opened herself up to anyone else before. Her anointing of Jesus is significant because she was revealing to the, de- the guest of the dinner how she saw Jesus and how she saw herself. She saw Jesus as Lord and she saw herself as a servant. She saw Jesus as worthy of everything she could give. And in a single act, she gave her greatest possession. She gave up what other people might think about her. And she gave all of herself to Jesus. And the only reason she did this was because she knew him. She understood him for who he really was. She knew him more intimately, even better than some of the disciples at this point. Because intimacy is knowing someone beyond the surface. Really knowing who they are. Mary realized this early on when she first met Jesus. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at Mary of Bethany uh, meeting Jesus at Martha's home. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now as they were reclining, or excuse me, wrong scripture. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who was also seated at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not, know, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the serving all by myself. Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Mary knew Jesus. She sat at his feet, listening to his word, when she could have been distracted and worried about other things. She chose the one thing that was necessary. She chose intimacy with Jesus. Mary knew Jesus. And because of her relationship with him, it was from that place that she gave to him. And and honestly, it's not even hard to imagine someone like Judas or or anyone responding the way that we see Judas respond here in verse 4 in a second. Uh, This this gift was extraordinary. Judas' response, verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And John, whenever Judas is named, it's always followed with something like the one who will betray Jesus. And none of the gospels uh, contain his story about how he became a follower of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I've often pictured Judas like this. You guys see uh, over there in the corner, just seeing he's hiding out. And I have to say Judas, because there was actually another disciple named Judas Could you imagine he's sharing the gospel after Jesus's ascension? Yeah. And then this guy named Judas betrayed Jesus. And, and they're like rolling their, they're like, isn't that your name? You know, uh, (laughs) but, but, but Judas, um, but Judas didn't look like this. This isn't what Judas looked like. Judas was one of his 12 disciples and he probably had a story very similar to the other disciples. He saw Jesus teaching and followed Or Jesus walked up to him and said, follow me, and he followed. Uh, I'm sure that he had genuine experiences, moments of clarity where he knew Jesus was the Messiah, the promised one. But at some point, a series of choices were made, a coin here, a coin there, compromise after compromise. And his relationship with Jesus became about 
what he could get out of the relationship, how he could exploit it for his own benefit. He viewed everything through the lens of how does this help me? So when Judas sees such an extravagant gift poured out on Jesus's feet, when he realizes that this gift is not going to benefit him, he's mad and he cloaks his frustration with a religious response, which he knew would garner the support of the other guests because it's like our, us at Christmas, uh, the thought of the poor and the less fortunate are at the forefront of our minds. But Judas's response is a selfish response. And John wants us to see something here that he does throughout his gospel. John uses contrasts. He contrasts light and darkness, but here he's contrasting the selflessness in the life of Mary and the selfishness in the life of Judas. Both followers of Jesus, Mary experienced and saw Jesus and experienced his love, and that moved her to give. Judas saw and experienced Jesus, and he sought what he could get out of it. Judas followed till 30 pieces of silver was more valuable to him than a relationship with Jesus. With this contrast in mind, I believe it's important that we ask ourselves this question. Does my relationship with Jesus look more like Judas or, or Mary? Am I like Judas only following Jesus for what I can get out of the relationship, only seeking my own benefit? Or am I like Mary resting in all that he has done and looking for opportunities to give more of myself? not because I have to, but because I get to. Judas took, Mary gave, and this extravagant gift wasn't about how much the perfume cost. In the kingdom of God, extravagance is not based upon how much something costs. It's based upon what it costs you. It's not about looking around saying, well, I can't give what they can and, and they have more giftings than me. Remember what Jesus said when he saw people giving in the temple. Mark 12, 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, he said, truly, I tell you, the poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Jesus is after our heart. And often our hearts are tied to what we have. But when it comes to Mary, we see what she was tied to. She gave what she had, what was in her hand, what the Lord had given her to steward up into that point. And, and, and when she was prompted to give, she gave it. We, we see her do that. We see her gladly pour it out on her feet. Mary wasn't tied to her possessions, her status, or how other people saw her. None of those things had a grip on her because she was gripped by him. Selfless living is not always accepted by those around you, even other Christians, especially other Christians. Often they're convicted by your lifestyle, and this is why we can't look for other people to approve of us. But we must rest in knowing that Jesus says that we are approved, that he will come to our defense. Jesus' defense, verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus here is not diminishing the need to care for the poor, but he is placing an emphasis upon this act and its timing. Mary's anointing of his body was preparing him for death, a death that she and none of the others realized was was days away. And Mary likely suddenly starting to feel some shame or, or questioning, did I do the right thing? Didn't have to defend herself because Jesus came to her, her defense. She was anointing him for burial. And normally this happened after a person died, but because Jesus was seen as a criminal, they were not permitted to anoint his body. Her selfless act was something she wouldn't have been able to do any other day. How 
How often do we miss out on moments like this with Jesus and Mary? Because selfishly we fear what other people might think about us, because we're tied to our comfortable lifestyle, because it's beneath us, because we're afraid to be undignified. Whatever the Holy Spirit is calling you to give, don't wait for the why. If Mary had awaited, it had been too late. And I, I believe that somebody needs to hear that. Like, I don't know what, what God is calling you to give, but don't wait. We live by faith and we give in faith, believing that he is good. And, and we often don't understand why till long after it's done. Have you ever rationalized your way out of giving something to the Lord? I have. I mean, Mary could have done the same thing, right? She, she could have said, yeah, we could uh, use the money to, to buy food and, and clothe them and house them. And all those things are good. But none of those things are the one thing that she was called to give. Instead, she was led by the Spirit. She didn't rationalize away what she knew she was called to do. She chose the best before by sitting at Jesus' feet. And she chose the best again by anointing his feet. It's at his feet where we find everything we need. It's at his feet where he sets us free from distraction. It's at his feet where worries and anxieties are removed. It's at his feet where he heals us. It's at his feet where he transforms us. It's at his feet where he frees us from other loves. Amen. Mary knew that. Mary experienced that. And, and when she left the dinner, she took something with her that no one else did. Everyone else left remembering the fragrance, but she carried it with her. What she had given to Jesus was now infused in her hair. Isn't Jesus amazing? Even when we think we're given to him, he finds a way to give back to us. When we pour ourselves out upon him, we are filled up with him. Because intimacy with Jesus frees us to live selflessly. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for being the perfect example to us. You're a beautiful example, Jesus. You gave everything for us. I just thank you for that. I thank you that um, you are our example. And, and Father, I pray that um, in, this next, in these next moments, Lord, that, that you would put your finger on what you're calling your people to give. God, that you would... Um, do what only you can do, that you would change hearts, uh, change minds, God, that we would see you rightly. Um, in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Uh, I would like for our altar time to look like this today. Um, I feel like Jesus is calling us to greater intimacy with him, no matter where you are on the spectrum. Um, of, of super close, there's more. Of distance, you know, you know that there's more. And I feel like he's saying this to us. I long to give you more of myself, but in order for me to fill you up, you need to pour yourself out. And the invitation to you today is to give whatever you're holding back, whatever the Holy Spirit has put in his fingers on, whether that's possessions, status, dignity, money, position, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit um, is, is going to pour himself out on us this, today. And, and here's how we're going to do this. We're going to open the altar um, up. Uh, completely. And, and Mary brought her gift to the Lord and she poured it out on her, on her and it was a, a thing between her and Jesus. And so I, I want you to, to do the same thing, um, to, to bring your, your gift to Jesus and, and spend time however long it needs to be. It doesn't matter. Stand, stand sit, kneel, whatever, uh, but come to the center. And then as you leave, what, what we're going to do is we're going to have pastors and elders over here on the side and on the side. So you're going to go out this way to go back to your seat. Um, and, and we're going to anoint you with oil because this is a symbolic act. You came to give something to Jesus, but just like Mary, you're going to leave anointed and carrying his fragrance. So would you stand with me as we praise and worship? And if you feel so led, Come to the front and, and give it away.
Is it a fragrance? And I'll pour my oil out. Is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vow. Is it a song I sing? And here's every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Just tell me. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth, heavens above, that I have found a beautiful, you are my treasure, my great reward, I just want Yeah, I wanna say, oh, just. 
Is it a song I sing? Then here's it. 